Gentili ospiti, benvenuti alla decima edizione di Leggendo Metropolitano. Avrò rinizio all'incontro come aiutare i nostri figli ad avere successo. Con la traduzione dell'interprete Milena Finazzi, diamo la parola ad Adele Diamond. Good, now you can hear me. Oh, I think it's a bit loud. My specialty is something called executive functions. Executive functions refers to things that you need when you can't go on automatic, when you can't rely on instinct or intuition, when you have to concentrate and pay attention. There are three core executive functions. One of them is inhibitory control. Inhibitory control involves resisting a strong inclination to do one thing and instead do what's most needed or appropriate. At the level of attention, it's focused attention. For example, being able to concentrate on the phone when somebody is talking to you in the room, I do that to my husband all the time. Or maybe there's something you want to find in the environment. Maybe there's a particular spice like thyme you're looking for in your spice rack, or there's a sign on the street to tell you to go where you want to go. Young children have very immature attentional control. They can easily get distracted by beautiful posters on the wall. Now, kindergarten teachers and first grade teachers love to decorate their classrooms with beautiful posters and pictures on the wall. But that distracts the young children who are, are easily distractible. They don't have such good focused attention yet. And so research shows that young children are better able to pay attention and learn more when the walls are more bare, when you don't have all those interesting things to pull your attention. It doesn't mean the classroom needs to be ugly, but they're able to pay attention better when it's more bare. On the other hand, you can easily underestimate how capable young children can be. And I'm going to show you a video in a second of a three-year-old who's showing really remarkable perseverance and focused attention, even though there are lots of distraction in the environment. There's no sound on here, but it'll be very clear what he's doing.
Yay. Now, how many of you would have had the patience to wait this whole time? He's so close. He know that he knows what he wants to do. You're tempted to want to go in there and help. So it's important to be patient. Give children time to figure things out on their own. Don't intervene too early to help out. We adults tend to want to do for children, but less is more. When a child's struggling, our first inclination is to get in there and want to help. But if you solve the problem, you're the strong, heroic one, and the child is the weak, needy one. Have faith in the child's abilities and intellect. The second aspect of inhibitory control is self-control, the level of behavior. And that involves resisting temptations, not acting impulsively, thinking before you speak or act. And for little children, so much of what they do revolves around demands on inhibitory control. Wait your turn, raise your hand, don't grab another child's toy, don't eat sweets before dinner, don't pee in your pants, they're all of these don'ts. And for all of us, there's many times we need self-control in every day. For example, don't blurt out the first thing that comes to mind. Resist acting in the heat of the moment, like when you write a really angry email message, but you don't press send right away. Not to jump to the conclusion about what something must have meant, because we can often be wrong. To wait. And the discipline and perseverance to resist the many temptations to quit and not finish what you started. To stay and finish the task, even though maybe it's so easy you're bored or it's so difficult you're frustrated, and certainly there are more fun things you could be doing. To continue to work, even though the reward might be a long time in coming, to be able to delay gratification. All of that requires self-control. Evidence shows that discipline accounts for over twice as much of the variance in final grades as does IQ, even in college. Self-control saves us from putting our foot in our mouth or making a social faux pas. Think of all the trouble you'd get in if you told your boss what you really thought of him or her if you grabbed whatever you wanted without asking or paying, or did other socially inappropriate or hurtful things. If you want to change, if you want to mend your ways, you need self-control. Without inhibitory control, we'd be at the mercy of impulses, old habits of thought or action, and stimuli in the environment that pull us this way or that. Inhibition helps make it possible for us to change and choose how we want to react and how we want to behave, rather than being unthinking creatures of habit. It doesn't make overriding habits or automatic responses easy, but at least it makes it possible. Helping children develop rudimentary self-control and scaffolding that opens up the possibilities for the best kind of education, because then Children can work on their own, individually or in small groups, without constant supervision and without worrying that the class will be chaos because the children can exercise some self-control. And now the teacher can give each child individual attention without the other children having to wait while the teacher's doing that. The teacher can carefully observe each child. Children can work on what interests them. They can work at their own pace. It's fine if you're ahead on economics and I'm ahead on psychology. It doesn't matter. We're each doing our own thing. It doesn't matter if I'm working on one thing, you're working on another. We're working at different levels. And the teacher can give each child individualized instruction. Inhibitory control is the executive function most predictive of long-term outcomes. Children with better inhibitory control that is, children who were more persistent, less impulsive, and had better attention regulation as young children, later as teenagers, make less risky choices, 
have fewer unplanned pregnancies and are less likely to drop out of school than their peers who as young children had worse self-control. And as adults 30 years later, they have better health, higher incomes and better jobs, fewer run-ins with the law, and report that they have a higher quality of life than their peers who as young children had worse inhibitory control. And that's true controlling for almost every variable under the sun. That's based on a study of 1,000 children born in the same city in the same year, followed for 32 years with a 96% retention rate. I wish I did the study. Working memory is the second core executive function. It involves holding information in mind and working or playing with it. Working memory is critical for anything that unfolds over time because that always requires holding in mind what came earlier and relating that to what's happening now. It's obvious for oral language, because you're not hearing what I said earlier. You have to relate it to what I'm saying now. But it's also true for reading, because you don't see all the words at the same time. You have to hold in mind what you read earlier. Reasoning, creative problem solving requires working memory. So many things do. Working memory and inhibitory control each independently predict both reading and math competence throughout the school years, from the earliest grades through university, often better than does IQ. Executive functions need to be continually challenged to see improvements, not just used, but challenged. One great way to improve children's focused attention and working memory is simply to tell them stories. I'm a huge fan of storytelling. Storytelling requires and invites your rapt attention for extended periods, sustained, focused attention, and working memory to hold in mind everything that's happened so far, the different characters' identities, the story details, and relating all of that to the new information you're getting now. Without the aid of pictures on the page, or puppets acting it out, or video. You have to hold it all in mind. A researcher randomly assigned children in kindergarten or grade one to storytelling or story reading. For storytelling, only the teacher saw the, the pages in the book. For story reading, the teacher, after she read each page, would turn it around so the children could see the pictures on the page. So she would read and turn. For storytelling, that she didn't turn the pages. And what they found is vocabulary and recall improved more in the children assigned to storytelling than in the children assigned to story reading. There's a landmark study that just came out a couple of months ago that shows that the conversation between children and adults aids brain development over and above socioeconomic status or the number of words spoken or heard. The critical variable is the number of conversational turns taken. That's, not, that's talking with the child as opposed to talking to or at the child. Children who experienced more conversational turn taking had more advanced maturation of Broca's area in the brain and better language skills. And this explained over 50% of their language ability and verbal abilities. And that builds on a lot of earlier work that shows the conversation that takes place in the context of reading seems to have more benefit than even the reading itself. The more interaction, the more conversation between the story reader or the storyteller and the children, the more actively engaged the children are, the more their vocabulary improves. Maybe that's one reason the researcher found better results from the storytelling. Because in the storytelling, you maintain the eye contact with the child. You're inviting the child in more. Whereas if you're doing story reading, you have to keep looking down at the page, breaking eye contact with the child. We don't know that's the reason, but that's one possibility. So this is a wonderful scene, but this is also good, where only the speaker sees the pages in the book. While story reading is wonderful, I encourage it, storytelling 
should improve attention and working memory more because it challenges them more. You may think that children need basic literacy skills to be ready for school. They don't. Children need basic language skills, oral language, to be ready for school. Oral language is the foundation of literacy. Young children need to be exposed to a lot of rich oral language. Vocabulary assessed at age three strongly predicts reading at ages nine to 10. Over the course of evolution, our brains became adapted for oral language, were biologically predisposed to acquire oral language. But we have no biological predisposition for reading or writing. They're too new. They're, they're too new in terms of cultural inventions. So some children can learn to read early, easily. But other children, because we don't have this biological predisposition, can't learn to read early. They can't learn to read till maybe they're seven years of age. We don't want children to feel like failures. We, don't, we want children to love learning and love school and believe that they're capable. It's more important that children don't think they're dumb and can't succeed in school than for them to start reading at an early age. In Finland, they don't start school till they're seven, and by grade four, Finnish children score better than children anywhere in the world on the standardized exams. There's a very powerful role of the expectations we have for ourselves. We don't want a child to start coming with an expectation that I can't succeed in school and I can't do this, because then he won't be able to. An example of how expectations affect us can be seen in something called stereotype threat, which is a little cottage industry in social psychology. There are many stereotypes in our culture. One of them is that in general, women are worse in math than men. And sure enough, when a research group went to a university and gave a standardized math test, as a group, the male students performed better than the female students. That's usual. Then they took the exact same exam to an exactly comparable group of university students. The only difference was, before they gave the exam, they said this particular exam has been designed to be gender neutral. On this particular exam, women score as well as men. And what happened? The women scored as well as the men. It was the same exam. The only difference was the expectations the women had for themselves. Avoid children having failure experiences. Hold off on requiring that four or five or six-year-olds be able to read. Don't hold anybody back. If the child can read early, that's fine. But don't require it. The child who starts to read later is going to be just as good a reader as the child who starts to read early. Children drilled in reading in kindergarten will test better in reading at the end of kindergarten than children who only do oral language in kindergarten. But by the end of second grade, I predict that those steeped in oral language in kindergarten will be the better readers. Children need to believe in themselves. And there are two roots to that. One is they need to feel that we believe in them, that we fully expect them to succeed. It's important to communicate loud and clear the faith and expectation that each child is going to succeed, is going to find his way. Toddlers fall on the way to walking. I've never seen a toddler who's so brilliant at walking. The first time they get up, they walk perfectly and they never fall. They fall. They might fall four or five times on a given day. It would never occur to us to say to the toddler on that day, you get a D in walking today. We never say that. What do we say? We say, don't worry. I'm sure you're going to be able to do this. We all say that. How different is that from what children hear in school? What they hear in school is you get a D today. Instead of, there's no question you're going to be able to do this. And we together are going to figure out a way to make that happen. Your expectations for how a child will perform have a huge effect on how that child does perform. If you expect to see problems, you will. If you expect to see strengths, you will. Focus on children's strengths rather than on their weaknesses and failings. Help them discover their strengths and their passions. 
Goethe said, treat people as if they were what they ought to be, and you help them become what they're capable of being. Our expectations for children with disabilities or from disadvantaged backgrounds are often far too low. Better to always be open to the possibility that any child might go on to do amazing things. The other route to children believing in themselves is to give them doable challenges so they can see for themselves that they're capable. It's not enough for you to say, I see that you're capable. They have to see it for themselves or they don't believe you. Not giving children challenges is doing them a disservice. Show you believe in them by letting them take on hard challenges. If you don't let them try, they won't fall on their faces or fail or get hurt, but they never have a chance to excel either or prove to themselves that they can do it. Give a child the time and space to figure out things on his or her own. Another way to show children we believe in them is to give them an important responsibility. There's a study that shows this, and it was funded by Coca-Cola, so it's called the Coca-Cola Study. In a school in the U.S., there were fifth graders who were very bad behavior problems. They were giving the school a lot of trouble, and they were also terrible readers. And the administrator of the school came to the children and said, I have a very important responsibility for you. This is very serious. I would like you to tutor the second graders who are struggling in reading. They couldn't read better than the third graders, but they read better than the second graders so they could tutor them. Very shortly, the behavior problems disappeared. And by the end of the year, not only were those second graders reading better, but the fifth graders were reading better too. Empower children. Give them a voice, a say in the decision making. Give them some sense of ownership about what's happening in the classroom and in the school. Let them help solve problems you're working on. Find ways so that a challenged child can be included in everything. Create opportunities for that child to interact with others in safe, circumscribed ways. Interacting one-on-one -on -one or with a few children may be less overwhelming than interacting with a whole class. Let each child progress at his or her own rate and choose what to work on. Imitation is an easier, simpler relationship to understand than normal human interaction. And here a child with an autism spectrum disorder can be in charge if you're doing imitation, which is not usually the case. I'm going to show you a short video next. And let me tell you what it is. First, you'll see an excerpt from three minutes where the experimenter is just sitting on a, on a sofa stone-faced. She doesn't say anything, she doesn't do anything, no expression, and the severely autistic child doesn't even notice her, doesn't pay any attention to her, he's just exploring the objects in the room. Then for the next three minutes, the experimenter gets up and she's gonna imitate everything the child does, very carefully watching him and imitating him. And then, for the last three minutes, she's going to go back to the sofa and sit stone-faced. No expression, no reaction. The video is only four minutes. It's not the whole nine minutes of the session. Yeah. You can see the first period of the experiment. The experimenter is sitting still, waiting for the child. The child is a nine-year-old, non-verbal boy with autism. His mental age is 30 months. He has just entered the room and focused his attention on the objects, not on the still person. After three minutes, the experimenter walks to the child.
she takes the identical object and will imitate everything the child does, facial expressions, sounds, motoric behaviors. Notice the attention of the child to the experimenter's behavior. He controls and tests that she imitates him. Three minutes later, the experimenter walks to the sofa and pose a still face again. Note that all along the three minutes of the second still face, the only concern of the child will be the still person. At the end, the adult is interactive again. Scripts for plays, calls for dancing, reduce uncertainty about what, what you should do, and they can also be helpful for children with autism. It's okay to practice your role repeatedly if you're in a play, even in front of the mirror, although that would be odd in social interaction. And that brings me to the last video of the uh, talk. It's this one's even shorter, it's only three minutes. This is about children and autism in theater. Since theater was started with the idea that the theater is an ideal environment to teach a variety of skills that children with autism especially need to learn. So for example, learning how to improve social skills, how to communicate not only verbally but through gesture, by expressing emotions, through movement. The theater, by nature, provides an opportunity to explore and to learn these various skills. So by teaming up children with autism with actors who are, shall we say, experts in social skills and verbal communication and expression, and they work with them not only at the theater, but also we videotape them doing their particular role. And then we broadcast this on the web and they're able to practice from home with their parents or others the very roles that they then will be performing on the stage. They range in age from 6 to 16. They have seven boys and one girl. And they've been teamed up with other actors in the show. We have seen amazing changes in them already. Um, at first, a couple of them kind of tentative to come into the theater. It's rather stressful, a lot of stimulation going on, which a lot of children with autism don't like. But 
Within a very short period of time, they already started really developing these nice relationships with their buddies, started singing along, and really being embraced and adopted by the theater company. I think that typically developing children, the actors are getting a lot out of this as well. They have clearly gained an appreciation of children with autism and neurodevelopmental disorders. I think many of them have taken a sense of uh, pride in being a buddy and helping out and being co-actors with them. I think this is going to generalize to their school environment. I think one of the most meaningful comments that I've heard uh, about the program have come from the parents. So they're seeing them go to classroom, be more interactive with other children. They're seeing them being less stressed and tentative in new situations. These are the things that we're really thrilled about with Sense Theater. It's clear that the theater is a magical environment for our kids, and we're hoping to be able to reach out to many more so that it, they can benefit like many of our kids have in this production. The third core executive function is cognitive flexibility. Seeing an issue from different perspectives, thinking about it in a whole new way, seamlessly adjusting to change or the unexpected. Einstein said, if you always do what you always did, you'll always get what you always got. So for example, an example of thinking about something in a different way is what way is a carrot like a cucumber? Then in what way is a carrot like an orange? Now you think about color. In what way is a carrot like a potato? Maybe you think about where it grows. In what way is a carrot like an apple? Just different ways of thinking about carrot. Also, it involves being able to be flexible enough to take advantage of serendipity, a sudden opportunity. Flexible enough to get around problems or obstacles. Even flexible enough to admit you were wrong when you get new information. If there's a problem we haven't been able to solve, can you think outside the box to conceive of the problem, frame the problem in a whole new way, come up with a completely different way of attacking it? Can you creatively think of different uses, for example, for a table? I mean, obviously, you can write on a table. You can eat on a table. What crazy outside-the-box things can you do with a table? For example, you can hide under it. You can turn it on its side to protect you from things people might throw at you. You can turn it upside down to play horseshoes, use it as a percussion instrument, or chop it up for firewood. Just thinking outside the box. How can we stop ourselves from getting really upset when a child misbehaves? What we usually get upset about is the intent we think is behind what the child is doing. But we can use cognitive flexibility to reframe. A child might be acting in the most awful may way because the child's been terribly hurt and is afraid of being hurt again. So he'll push you away before you have the chance to push him away. Or he'll test you to see if you're really somebody he can feel safe with. If we see the misbehavior as coming from hurt, we can react completely differently. So the three core executive functions then give rise to higher order executive functions like problem solving, reasoning, and planning. And reasoning and planning are what fluid intelligence is all about. Executive functions depend on prefrontal cortex and the other neural regions with which it's interconnected. Prefrontal cortex, the area of the brain I specialize in, is overrated. You, to learn something new, we need prefrontal. But after something is no longer new, the people who perform best are often using prefrontal least. This is an example from an early neuroimaging study of a task that requires prefrontal cortex. And some subjects show prefrontal activation on both sides of the brain. Some show it more on one side. Some show it more on the other side. Two of our subjects didn't show it at all. These subjects are Ruth Brigida and Kathy O'Craven, my colleagues, collaborators on the study. And because they were familiar with the task, prefrontal activation dropped out. When something's new, those who recruit prefrontal most usually perform best. But when you're really good at it, 
you're usually not using prefrontal cortex so much. We want tasks to be so familiar and well-learned that prefrontal cortex is no longer needed. We want the task to be handed off to older regions of the brain that have had far longer to perfect their functioning and can, can subserve that task ever so much better than prefrontal can. When we try to be in control, we don't do things nearly as well as when we aren't trying to be in control. When we try to force things, we tend to mess them up. A child may know intellectually at the level of prefrontal cortex that he shouldn't hit another. But in the heat of the moment, if that knowledge hasn't been passed on from prefrontal to older regions of the brain, the child will hit another. Even though if you asked him, should you hit, he says no, he knows you shouldn't do it. It's the difference between knowing it at an intellectual level and having it be second nature or automatic. The only way something becomes automatic, becomes passed off from prefrontal, is through action, repeated action. Nothing else will do. There's been great interest in trying to improve executive functions. Luckily, there are examples of improving executive functions at every age, from infancy through old age, so we know it can be done. But most ways that people have tried have not worked well. Executive function training transfers, but the transfer is narrow. What that means is that you improve on what you practice, and that transfers to other contexts where those same skills are needed. But you only improve on what you practice. Improvement doesn't transfer to other skills. There's been a lot of interest in computerized cognitive training, like luminosity, CogMed, etc. If you train on nonverbal working memory, it doesn't even generalize to verbal working memory usually. If you train on one type of reasoning, it doesn't generalize to a different type of reasoning. The transfer is very narrow. CogMed is the computerized method for training working memory with by far the most and the strongest evidence. Over 80% of the studies find that CogMed makes for improvement on what you train on CogMed. But only one-third of the studies find any transfer to anything else that you did not train on specifically in CogMed. Thus, it's fair to conclude that working memory computerized training improves working memory. But the results have generally been disappointing with narrow benefits that fade away in several months' time. If improvement in multiple executive function skills is your goal, then you need to engage in activities that require and train each of those different skills. Executive function gains from training in traditional martial arts and certain school curricula have been wider. It's not that the generalization is wider. It's that these programs train more different executive function skills, and so you get narrow transfer to each of those different skills. There's been very little study of CogMed with older adults, but working memory deteriorates earlier and more severely during aging than most other cognitive skills. The few studies of CogMed and NBAC training, another working memory training, with older adults suggest that such targeted working memory training might be especially beneficial for adults who have declines in working memory because that may be their only decline. They may not need wide generalization because their only problem might be in working memory. Sometimes the reason something works is completely different from what anyone expected. Although most studies of CogMed don't mention the mentoring component, to be certified to administer CogMed, adults have to get trained in and commit to mentoring those doing CogMed. There's a new study out of the Netherlands that suggests that the mentoring component might be what's driving the benefits rather than the computerized games that the developers of CogMed are so proud of. Whether executive function gains are seen depends on the way an activity is done. Researchers randomly assign children in kindergarten through grade five, either to traditional Taekwondo or to standard phys ed, and they did this all year these programs. At the end of the school year, 
the children in Taekwondo showed more gains in all the dimensions of executive function. And this generalized to multiple contexts and was seen on multiple measures. Traditional martial arts emphasize self-control, discipline, inhibitory control, character development. For example, you're not supposed to go in there and immediately go for your opponent. You're supposed to wait, use inhibitory control. Wait until your opponent is slightly off balance. Maybe he's going for you. And now go in and take advantage. So you have to exercise self-control. In a study with adolescent juvenile delinquents, one group was trained on traditional Taekwondo. The other was trained on modern martial arts. Martial arts only as a physical activity, only as a competitive sport, nothing about self-control or character development. Those in traditional Taekwondo showed less aggression and anxiety and improved in social ability and self-esteem. But those in modern martial arts showed more juvenile delinquency and aggressiveness and decreased self-esteem and social ability. A relatively understudied approach is mindfulness practices involving movement. And that includes things like Taekwondo, Tai Chi, Chinese mind-body practices, and an Italian program called Quadrato Motor Training. And these have shown the strongest benefits so far of any method tried to improve executive functions. Now, often initial findings look strong, and then they don't hold up in subsequent studies. And there have only been eight studies of these mindfulness practices that involve movement. But 100% of those studies have found benefits to executive function. No other approach to improving executive functions can claim anything like that. Contrary to influential reviews of the benefits of aerobic exercise, the majority of aerobic exercise interventions have not produced improvements either in memory or executive function. No suggestion of benefits in 60% of the studies that have looked at aerobic exercise. The results are even worse for resistance training, weight training, where 86% of the studies don't even find a suggestion of executive function benefits. But people who are more physically active and have better aerobic fitness have better executive functions. Okay? Now that's a seeming contradiction. People who are more physically active and more physically fit have better executive functions but aerobic interventions, even ones that last as long as a year, do little to improve executive functions. It could be that the correlation between physical and cognitive fitness is due to one or more other variable and not to better fitness per se. For example, it might be that the people who are more physically fit have the good sense to eat better and get more sleep, and maybe that's why they have better executive functions. Or causality might go in the opposite direction. Since you probably need good executive functions, especially good inhibitory control and discipline, to maintain a regular exercise regimen. Then there are likely differences in physical activity experiences and its characteristics. Many who are drawn to exercise have been physically active their whole lives, not just for the months or the year of a study. Many people who maintain better fitness do so by participating in physical activities that involve cognitive challenges and complex motor skills. They might be doing soccer or beach volleyball, etc. Perhaps aerobic exercise interventions haven't seen more executive function benefits because they've had minimal cognitive or motor skill demands. For example, riding a stationary bike or running on a treadmill. But results for aerobic interventions with more emphasis on cognitive skills and motor skills have shown just this disappointing results. Most studies have looked at decontextualized skills, abstracted from the sport they're used in, such as practicing dribbling a basketball but never actually playing basketball. We're less motivated to master arbitrary skills abstracted from their practical real-world use. A recent study evaluated two different ways to teach tennis. 
One way was the traditional way, like you and I probably learned. First, you practice your forehand, and after you get fairly good at that, then you practice your backhand, and eventually you play tennis. The other group learned to play tennis by playing an age-appropriate, simplified version of tennis from the beginning. Okay, so one group learns the individual skills first, another group starts playing tennis from the beginning. And what they found is that those who learn tennis by playing tennis from the beginning improve faster on tennis and improve more in executive functions. This is one executive function result where you see benefits in both groups but more in those who started playing tennis first. And here on this executive function measure, you see no benefit in those who learn the individual skills first and only a benefit in those who learn tennis by playing tennis. Many people who freely choose to do aerobic activities enjoy them more than people who are randomly assigned to do them. And there's evidence that any benefit from physical activity may be proportional to how much joy you get out of that physical activity. Boring exercise is particularly unlikely to improve executive functions. Many people who maintain better fitness do so by participating in activities that engage their minds, their hearts, and their souls. Many are passionate about these activities and deeply committed to them. They're an important part of their social lives and an important part of their personal identity. I think that gets at the crux of it. Improving aerobic capacity per se or improving particular cognitive skills isolated from their use in any activity is less likely to improve executive functions than touching the hearts and minds of participants as a commitment to a holistic, coherent activity can do. I propose that what's needed is to engage people in activities they really care about where improving executive functions is needed for what they want to do, where mentors and experiences inspire and instill self-confidence. We never evolve to learn for learning's sake. While training and challenging executive functions is needed for them to improve, that alone is probably not enough to get the best results. It's likely that indirectly supporting executive functions by lessening things that impair them and enhancing things that support them is also critical. And here's why. Prefrontal cortex is the newest area of the brain over the course of evolution and the most vulnerable. If you're sad or stressed, lonely or not physically fit, prefrontal cortex and executive functions are the first to suffer and suffer the most. Conversely, we show better executive functions when we're happy, we feel socially supported, and we're healthy and physically fit. We have better executive functions when we're not feeling sad or depressed. When we're sad, we have worse working memory and selective attention. When we're happy, we have better working memory and selective attention. The most heavily researched predictor of creativity and social psychology is mood. The most robust finding is that a happy mood leads to greater creativity, specifically in the sense of better cognitive flexibility. It enables people to work more flexibly and to see potential relatedness among atypical or unusual members of categories. It's important children do things that give them joy. Joy is not the opposite of serious. There's no reason why serious business-like learning can't be joyful. The distinction between work and play disappears when you're doing something you thoroughly enjoy. Are these children working or playing? They love to do things in the kitchen. Are these young people working or playing? What about these buddy musicians, working or playing? Whether something is work, onerous, or play, fun, is not an intrinsic property of the activity. Any academic subject could be fun. When you're lucky enough to work on something you thoroughly enjoy, then work feels like play. Learning can and should be joyful. Research shows we learn more and get more done when we're happy. Most executive function interventions have focused only on training executive functions 
or only improving aerobic fitness to improve executive functions, ignoring powerful emotional factors. Yet if you're passionate about an activity, you'll devote lots of time and effort to it, and it's the hours practicing, pushing yourself to improve, that drives the benefit. One route to loving what you're doing is to feel you're making a difference, making the world a better place, or helping your family or community. The sky's the limit to what young people can achieve if they're engaged in activities they're passionate about, where mentors and experiences inspire and instill self-confidence. Our brains work better when we're not in a stressed emotional state, and that's particularly true for prefrontal cortex and executive functions. Stress impairs executive functions and can cause anyone to look as if he or she has an executive function impairment like ADHD. When you don't, you're simply stressed. You may have noticed that when you're stressed, you can't think as clearly or exercise as good self-control. When I'm stressed, I reach for the chocolate. Here are some of the neurobiological reasons for why that's true. St even mild stress increases the level of the neurotransmitter dopamine only in prefrontal cortex. It floods prefrontal cortex with dopamine, so prefrontal cortex can't work, work properly. Prefrontal cortex has more receptors for cortisol than any other region of the brain. And one week of stress in preparation for a major university exam disrupts the communication between prefrontal cortex and other regions of the brain and disrupts executive function. It comes back when the stress is over, but while you're stressed, prefrontal cortex can't communicate as well with the other regions of the brain. If you're stressed, you can't be the parent you want to be. If you're stressed, your children will pick up on it. It will make them stressed. And if they're stressed, their executive functions will suffer and they won't be able to do as well in school. So relax. You're not perfect. You're going to make mistakes. You don't need to be perfect. Per imperfect is not the same as worthless. Everybody's imperfect. It's OK to mess up. Everybody makes mistakes, even the people you most respect. Don't be so hard on yourself when you mess up. Many children are so terrified of making a mistake, they're afraid to try anything new. We need to let children know it's OK to make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes, even us. In the program El Sistema, they say, don't worry about making a mistake. It's just what happens on the way to getting good. Children can't relax if they feel a lot of pressure to succeed and not mess up, feeling it would be terrible if they made a mistake. Children can't relax if they're worried you might embarrass them if they make a mistake. They need to feel safe to push the limits of what they know, venture into the unknown, to take the risk of making a mistake or being wrong. The only way to completely avoid mistakes is to stay with what you already know and stop growing. Right? Because by definition, if you go beyond what you know, you don't know. So you have a 50-50 chance of being wrong. If you want to be sure you're not wrong, then you stay with what you know. But if you stay with what you know, you don't learn and you don't grow. Einstein said, anybody who's never made a mistake has never tried anything new. And I love this quote. You've never failed until you've tried for the last time, and you've never lost until you quit. Samuel Proctor Macy was born in the segregated South in the early 1900s. You know he experienced a lot of discrimination and setbacks. Yet he rose to become one of the most decorated chemists of the 20th century, the first African-American professor at the US Naval Academy. You haven't failed until you stop trying. Help children see that we all have limitations and we all have gifts and contributions to make. Help children accept that they do have whatever problems they have, but also help them to not let them limit what they can do. When one door closes, another door opens. But we often look so long and so regretfully upon the closed door that we do not see the ones which open for us. Life is difficult. Yet once you accept that life is difficult, 
It ceases to be difficult. It's just what is. Once suffering is accepted, it ceases to be suffering. Our brains work better when we're not feeling lonely or socially isolated. And that's particularly true for prefrontal cortex and executive functions. We are fundamentally social. We need to belong. We need to fit in and be liked. Children who are lonely or ostracized have more difficulty learning. What do children need most? That's simple, to be loved, to know that you care deeply about them. That's all they need. Your humanity is more important than your knowledge or skill or doing the textbook perfect thing. That's it. That's all you have to do to have great children. Just love them. People who feel lonely or are focused on anticipating being lonely show worse executive functions than people who feel or anticipate feeling more socially supported. In one study, they gave subjects a survey when they came in the lab. And embedded in the survey were questions like, do you feel lonely, do you feel socially supported? And what they found is prefrontal cortex worked less efficiently in people who reported they felt lonely or ostracized. Being socially excluded activates the very same brain network as that for physical pain. And the more social pain you're feeling, the more active this network is. We need to feel that people who care about us, believe in us, and will be there for us. And we need to feel we're part of something larger than ourselves. A, a researcher from the UK named Melhus looked at early education around the world, every country he could get data for. And he found that the variable that matters most in determining the outcomes of early childhood education is not the number of children, it's not the adult-child ratio, it's not the quality of the materials. What matters most is the caring relationship between the adults and the children. Early life stress can cause accelerated telomere shortening. Telomeres are the protective tips at the end of chromosomes. You can think of them like the plastic tips on the end of your shoelaces that keep your shoelaces from fraying. Telomeres keep chromosomes from fraying. So a cell dies when its telomeres get too short, so you can sort of think of telomeres as determining the lifespan of cells and therefore the lifespan of us. By five years of age, children who have experienced two or more early adverse experiences have shorter telomeres already by age five than children who haven't experienced these um, uh, bad experiences. And by age 10, the difference is even greater. But maternal sensitivity and warmth can completely override the effect of early adversity on telomere length, completely override. So here's what I said before. The children exposed to bad experiences growing up, really adverse experiences, have shorter telomeres than the children who've had good experiences. But this group has just as bad experiences, but were lucky enough to have terrifically responsive moms. And their telomeres are absolutely the same length as those who haven't had any of the adverse experiences. And that's the study. This is probably also true of dads. It's just that the research so far has been done only on moms. The single greatest mitigating factor to early adversity or trauma is terrific mothering. Responsive parenting by a caring, warm adult. I don't think it has to come from a mom or even a relative. Remember, I talked about before, responsive parenting, listening and taking turns in conversation with your child, also aids the maturation of brain regions that are important for language development. We're not just intellects with emotions and social needs, we also have bodies. The brain doesn't recognize the same sharp division between cognitive and motor function that we impose in our thinking. The same or substantially overlapping brain regions subserve both cognitive and motor function. For example, an area of the brain called the pre-SMA is important for sequential tasks. And it doesn't matter whether they're sequential motor tasks or sequential cognitive tasks. Motor development and cognitive development appear to be fundamentally intertwined. The different parts of the human being are fundamentally interrelated. Each part, cognitive, spiritual, social, emotional, and physical, 
is affected by and affects the others. The best and most efficient way to foster any of these is probably to foster all of them. We have to care about children's emotional, social, and physical well-being if we want them to be able to problem solve, exercise self-control, or display any of the other executive functions. If a child is stressed, sad, lonely, or not physically fit, the very academic performance the school is trying to improve will take a hit. Returning to my prediction, activities that will most successfully improve executive functions will not only work on directly improving executive functions by training and challenging them, but will indirectly support executive functions by lessening things that impair them, like stress or loneliness, and enhance things that support them, like joy and physical vitality. What activities directly train and challenge executive functions and indirectly support them by addressing our social, emotional, and physical needs? What activities touch the hearts and minds of young people, inspiring them, challenging them to reach for the stars, building their self-confidence and pride? Traditional activities that have been around for millennia. For tens of thousands of years across all cultures, storytelling, dance, art, music, and play have been part of the human condition. People in all cultures made music, sang, danced, did sports, and played games. There are good reasons why those activities have lasted so long and arose everywhere. These activities challenge our intellects, our executive functions, make us happy and proud, address our social needs, and help our bodies develop. They require planning, cognitive flexibility to respond to unexpected reactions or difficulties, perseverance even in the face of setbacks or failure, creative problem solving, indeed all the executive functions. The distinction between academic and enrichment activities is arbitrary. Critical executive function skills like reasoning, problem solving, self-control, working memory, and cognitive flexibility, all of these, can be taught through the arts, wilderness survival, physical activity, carpentry, auto mechanics, or play. Key is that the person really loved the activity and really want to do it. So he or she will spend a lot of time at it, pushing him or herself to improve. The activity could be almost anything. Could be caring for an animal. Could be doing a service activity or anything out in nature. I fear that activities needed for children to thrive are being cut from school curricula and from children's lives. Focusing exclusively on academic instruction as mainstream education tends to do may not be the best or most efficient way to improve cognition. Addressing children's social, emotional, spiritual, and physical needs may be key to whether they do well in school and in life. Nurturing the whole child may be critical for achieving the outcomes we all want for our children. Thank you very much for your attention.